Hello, and welcome to Wiley Efficient Learning. My name is Tyler Wood, and today we're going to be discussing technical analysis, and specifically the CMT program. Now, I know some of you are industry veterans, and you're here because you're trying to improve your professional practice. You have an interest in data visualization and charting. That's great. Some of you might be students with an interest in capital markets, and you've recognized that the CMT program is a great way to fast track your career in sales and trading. And for those of you who are about to embark on your journey towards pursuit of the CMT designation, I welcome you. And I think that's great because in this industry where there is rapid evolution, rapidly changing trends, there are tons of opportunities for fund managers, strategists, financial advisors, and many other positions, but each one is going to require a firm understanding of market price dynamics. Now, the CMT program will be an intensive exploration of the entire field of technical analysis and will offer specific insights on the study of price behavior. I'm glad you're here and for those of you who don't know the CMT Association, I'm proud to say that after having spent the last eight years working with them full time, the organization has made profound changes in the discipline of technical analysis while preserving the essence of what was so crucial as they formed in the late 1960s. Now today's lesson is not going to be a training or tutorial on how to apply technical indicators or teach you how to trade the markets. Instead, we're going to accomplish three very important things. Number one, we'll develop a common shared understanding of what technical analysis really is and bust some myths along the way. Number two, we're going to talk specifically about the CMT program, the exams, and I'm going to offer some study tips to help you on exam day. And the last thing, that's maybe most important to all of you is to talk about those career opportunities and some of the industry shifts that are taking place, creating a great opportunity for CMT charter holders. All right, let's get to it. So what is technical analysis? Well, at the CMT Association, we believe that technical analysis provides the tools for investors to successfully navigate the gap between intrinsic value and market price, two totally separate things across all asset classes through a disciplined, systematic approach to market behavior and the law of supply and demand. Now, what do all those fancy words mean anyway? Well, if you ask a CMT charter holder, they'll tell you that the best explanation is in a chart. And years ago, we came across the blog writings of one of the world's foremost experts in valuation. That's NYU Stern professor, Dr. Oswath Damodaran. And in his writings, which are a must read for anybody, he explores the forces that drive price either above or below intrinsic value. So in very simplistic terms, performance in the financial markets is measured by selling securities at a price that's higher than where you bought them. Seems pretty simple, right? There's a lot of ways to skin the cat. But value investors work in the equities markets, they're looking at valuation models like discounted cash flows and many ratios on the company and its stock to estimate that intrinsic value. Now an undervalued company is a good buy because they believe the price per share is going to go up as the company continues to perform. But Dr. Demoteron explored this gap that exists between value and price and identified these drivers of price like sentiment and market moods, the emotions of traders and investors, and the supply and demand relationships for individual shares. All right, here's another great illustration of this concept. And this comes from one of the co-founders of the CMT Association, Ralph Akampura. Now, anybody who's taken a class with Ralph has been taught this. He typically used IBM as it was the large cap stock of the day. Uh, we're going to use Apple today. So let's take a look at the company. Well, the company has a PE ratio. It's a great measure for what it's doing. It has competitors in the marketplace that you need to understand. It has a management team, and maybe they're very efficient or perhaps inefficient at allocating capital throughout the firm. You're going to look at maybe they pay a dividend, and valuing that company also includes understanding their products. That's what's going to create those future cash flows and revenue streams for the company. So as a fundamental investor, you have to understand the company that you're buying. But for a more complete view, you should also understand the stock, which has totally different drivers. Now, a stock has a price, and has volume that it trades at, and there are some other internal market statistics like open interest that you can look at. It has a supply and demand relationship for individual shares of that company, and of course there's the psychology 
the emotional aspect of traders and investors in the marketplace. So let's talk for a second about the psychology and the moods of investors. I'm sure you all know that the 2002 Nobel Prize in Economics went to Daniel Kahneman. But what's fascinating about that is Danny Kahneman is not an economist. He and his fellow psychologist, Amos Tversky, did some groundbreaking work in the 1970s. They looked at some of the cognitive biases and the emotional psychology of all human beings. Their research brought to light some things they call heuristics that impact our decision making on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, heuristics are just instincts or ingrained behaviors that we all abide by because they evolved with us and creates the human condition over thousands of years. So let's look at an example. Uh, they talk about the herding principle. Well, as Neanderthals, we found that it was safer to travel in the pack and don't separate from the group because you might get picked off by a saber-toothed tiger. Well, we still abide by the herding principle today. We can't let it go. And in investment terms, as technical analysts, we call that herding principle price momentum. All right, let's move right along and talk about those supply and demand relationships. I'm going to bring everybody back to their Econ 101 class. I know you remember this graph. And all it is telling us is that at a static supply, an increase in demand is going to move price equilibrium further up the supply curve. Demand drives price, right? Now, as technical analysts, we have studied the work of Charles H. Dow, who over 100 years before Kahneman and Tversky, studied these price behaviors and this herding principle in what then became the Wall Street Journal. Now he tracked this market behavior and understood in his equity indices that they moved in trends along a primary, secondary, and tertiary trend based on the behavior of investors. Now all he had to use was empirical price data. Unfortunately, he had no degree in psychology, but I'm sure you can think of some examples that have worked recently where you've seen this herding principle in effect. Perhaps you were buyers of Bitcoin in late 2017 when that crossed over $20,000 a coin. Now there's an example of a financial mania or this herding principle at an extreme. So what we're looking at here is a visual depiction of order book data from the first 30 minutes of trading on Bank of America stock. Now this trading activity includes the red dots and the blue dots. We've got supply up on top. Those are the sell orders for shares of Bank of America. And the blue dots are our demand. Those are the buy orders. You can see that people are willing to sell at prices much higher than they're willing to buy. But where those two orders meet, that's where we establish price. Now technical analysis is both the study of market price and a method for visualizing data. There's a ton of information in this chart. Right now we're just going to talk about one heuristic uh, called anchoring. So right here, as the trading activity moves along, it reaches $12. All of a sudden you can see a lot more little red dots and a lot more little blue dots. Well, what's so special about $12? Why? Why is there all this additional trading activity? Well, the answer is nothing. There's nothing special about $12 except that it's a big round number. And in the sea of infinite decimals, humans attach meaning to this. It's a milestone. The other factor that's happening here is that people anchor to the price at which they bought the stock or at which they sold it. So $12 is a spot where we're seeing a lot more demand, a lot more buyers, because they have anchored to this price. So let's take an example. Let's look at the buyers at $12 and you can see the stock price continues to trade down throughout the session. Let's say it moves down to $11, $10, $9. This is a bad trade for them. Now, their loss aversion, the psychological pain of lo losing money, creates a scenario for a lot of traders and investors where they'll just hold on to that stock. They'll wait for it to get back to $12 so they can sell it and break even. The loss doesn't become real until they sell it. A great technical analyst is going to cut that losing trade as soon as it breaks their risk level and get out of that before losing all the money. But the behavior of anchoring to that price creates those additional sellers at $12. Now, as technical analysts, we don't call this the anchoring principle. We call it support or resistance. And you'll hear those terms all over the financial news media. What's fascinating is that resistance levels, where many investors are selling, once broken, they become support, and where many investors are buying. Support becomes resistance as well as traders and investors anchor to these price levels.
Okay, is everybody still with me? Let's move along. It's time for a quick history lesson, and we're going to bust our first myth. Over the last 10 years, people have begun to conflate technical analysis with things like HFT or high frequency trading. I'm sure many of you read Michael Lewis's book, Flash Boys, that conjured images of computer versus computer algo wars in a rigged marketplace. And while systematic funds and trading algorithms do leverage market statistics such as price, volume, and open interest to find those arbitrage opportunities, technical analysis and the CMT program are not byproducts of some new technology. In fact, it's the oldest game in town. Prior to Charlie Dow, this gentleman, Mr. Munahisa Homa, who was a rice merchant in the 18th century in Osaka, Japan, authored this book called The Foundations of Gold. And while the book has very little to do with gold itself, he does explore some of the psychological aspects of the market that were critical to his trading success. He recognized that rice traders, when it was festival season and the sun was shining and they were feeling really good, they'd come in and over-trade. They were exuberant and that would drive prices up. And if perhaps the weather was awful or they got into a fight with their spouse before coming to work, prices came down. Now, step one was to observe those behaviors. But the next thing that Monohisa Homa did was to visualize that price data. And he looked for the open, the close, the high, and the low price of the trading session. And he created what are modern day candlestick charts. It's a very powerful way to see the emotions of traders that create the buying and selling pressure. Now, this led to very profitable positions for Mr. Homa in the rice pits of Osaka, Japan. Adjusting for inflation, his personal assets would be worth an estimated $100 billion today. And we know that some of the world's most successful hedge fund traders, market analysts, and portfolio managers still pull up a candlestick chart when they evaluate a new position. Why is that? Because the behavior hasn't changed. All right, let's move along. We've talked about some shorter term examples. We've looked at 30 minutes of Bank of America trading. These behavioral biases can't possibly persist over the long run, right? This is just for traders. I'm a long-term investor, right? Wrong. These are ingrained, they're instinctual in all humans, which makes technical analysis a very powerful analytical approach over all time frames. Some of you may have read about the emotional roller coaster and Sir John Templeton's work. Now, he understood that a bull market went through phases, the emotional cycle of the secular bull and bear markets, or what Charlie Dow described as the primary trend, which persists over many years. Now, in the words of Sir John Templeton, the bull market is born or conceived at the bottom, at the end of the last bear market downturn. That's when people have experienced this psychological pain and the loss of all of their prior trades. That's the birth of the bear market, and it's born on total pessimism. Nobody wants to be involved in the financial markets because they just got cut in half. It grows. Very skeptical, but particularly institutions have to get back involved as the market starts to recover. You see more fund flows back into, uh, back into the marketplace, and then it matures on optimism. People start to see it reach towards Pre previous highs, or maybe set new all-time highs. And that's when investors and the wider public become extremely euphoric. They can see no end in sight to this bull market. That's when it meets its eventual demise, is when sentiment hits a bullish extreme. These, these principles work over any time frame. And a CMT charter holder is always going to have an advantage as they assess the sentiment of investors through many different data sources including sentiment surveys that go out to investors or institutional players. They look at commitment of traders reports from the CFTC. They might look at money flow. And increasingly, with big data analytics, they're looking at social media feeds on Twitter and stock twits to help understand where we are at in that psychology of the marketplace. This is a critical concept for those of you who are thinking about a career in private wealth management or financial advisory. Remember, your clients are going to feel absolutely positive at the point of maximum financial risk. And they're not going to want to even hear from you at the point where there is the greatest opportunity. All investors are going to underperform without a rigorous rules-based approach to investing. Okay, let's keep going. 
To be fair, it's not just the technical community that has looked at these ebbs and flows, these psychological behaviors. In fact, in the fundamental world, Mr. Robert Schiller came up with the CAPE ratio, or cyclically adjusted PE ratio. And that serves as a common reference point for understanding how expensive markets are relative to their historical average. Now, I've pulled up this chart to just show us a, a quick sample from 91 to the present. Historically, the average has fallen just below 16. You'll see a lot of anchors on CNBC talk about the new normal, that maybe a historical average should be reset at about 18. But right now, the U.S. equity markets are expensive. Analysts come on every day and they talk about, ah, I can't find any buying opportunities. There's nothing, there's nothing that I want to get into because it's all overpriced. Right now, the S&P is trading at nearly 34 times earnings. And analysts have argued all through the bull cycle that it's too expensive. Well, they've missed out on a whole lot of great performance if they felt it was too expensive. And while I don't disagree with their math, there is a lot of bullish price action that could happen if we were ever to return to the prior highs that happened in the late 90s tech bubble. People were buying equities at 45 times earnings and more. That is what the price dynamics, those factors that drive price like sentiment and supply and demand, those create tremendous opportunities late in the cycle. What's important to note is that the market forces can push prices way above or way below intrinsic value, and they can stay there much longer than you can remain solvent. Technical analysis, by definition, is diagnostic and reactive. We don't expect the market to conform to our model or our projections, and we certainly do not fight the trend. So we discussed Sir John Templeton's work about that cycle of emotions that happens during a bull market rally. Well, the same behavioral mistakes happen on the way down as well. Investors are anxious as that trend reverses. They enter a stage of denial as the prices continue to fall, and they experience fear, desperation, and panic. Finally, the downtrend reaches its highest volume and momentum as the last participants capitulate and sell off everything. Now, as many formidable technical analysts have noted, the popular media is a fairly consistent sentiment indicator for contrarian investors. We do the opposite of whatever they tell us. So here is the March 2009 issue of Time Magazine, and it's telling the public to hold on for dear life. This is the end of the financial markets as we know it. Put your savings into bullets and canned corn because the stock apocalypse has arrived. When in truth, by that point, stocks were extremely undervalued and presented a great buying opportunity. Now, I know many of you are watching this from around the globe and you're going to be working in various markets and across asset classes. These trends and behaviors are not simply a U.S. phenomenon. Whether you're on Wall Street, Bay Street, or Dalal Street, or anywhere in between, the CMT program is going to help you understand that market price behavior. Irrational behavior happens around the world because it's intrinsic to our human psychology. Now let's take a look at some global applications. This is a chart from Deutsche Bank that focuses on the Chinese market in the late spring of 2015. So you can see here the blue line represents the Shanghai Composite Index. And for almost five years, there offered no return to investors. Then all of a sudden, in late 14 and throughout 2015, it doubled in less than a year. Now let's look at that red line. That's showing us the number of new A-share brokerage accounts coming into the market. Now they say, there's nothing worse than watching your neighbor get rich, but I'm waiting to see somebody from the behavioral economics community publish their quantitative thesis on quantifying the jealousy factor in investing. Now there were more than 4 million new A-share brokerage accounts in one week. Imagine how much demand that created for Chinese equities. And what effect do you think it might have on price? These rallies mature on optimism and they expire on euphoria because demand drives price, and when it reaches that manic level, we see what happens. Let's take a look at a real specific example. And this is a test of your market knowledge. I'm wondering if any of you have Beijing Baofeng Technologies in your portfolio. It IPO'd on March 23, 2015, and I'd really like to know what they do. Because unless they invented cold fusion or time travel, there is no rational explanation, no valuation model that explains this kind of trading activity. It traded limit up 
every single day in the month of its IPO? Well, the answer is Beijing Baofeng Technologies was an exciting tech company. They were engaged in virtual reality and streaming video platforms, and they were coming into a sector with the highest momentum during a strong equity rally. There was a lot of demand for this stock. And it has performed well in the post-crisis period. It's currently trading at about 2,900 yuan per share. But as we discussed, what goes up must come down. And I just happened to be in Hong Kong in late 2015, and this was the paper that hit my door on July 7th, 2015. What happened was the bubble burst, the trading activity was out of control, and there was absolutely no support. There were no buyers, and things were falling through the floor. So the Chinese government intervened. They actually halted trading because the psychological pain of loss was so great. Now, CMT charter holders offer a distinct advantage for their clients and their firms because technical analysis is an extremely powerful toolkit to understand risk management techniques. Mastery of the CMT body of knowledge allows investors to set clear rules about what and when to sell. So now that we all have a common shared understanding of what technical analysis is and what it is not, let's dive into some specific topics about the CMT program and the exam process itself. The Chartered Market Technician, or CMT credential, is the preeminent global designation for practitioners of technical analysis. But CMT, the designation, now represents a diverse global membership of portfolio managers, systematic traders, financial advisors, research analysts, and many more. The CMT program itself is a self-study program built upon the CMT Association's core body of knowledge that includes current, industry-relevant concepts and treatments of technical analysis in the context of portfolio management. It's about how to manage money. Each level has a custom curriculum published by Wiley Efficient Learning, and each level leads to an exam. That three-level exam is administered twice a year in both June and December and delivered in a computer-based setting by Prometric all over the world. Candidates can only take one level at a time and you must pass each level in sequence. So for example, a candidate could start this December and finish the program in just 12 months, assuming they were successful on each level of the exam in sequence. Now, the candidate body of knowledge is based on a practice analysis of the profession at large. The CMT Association works with hiring managers as well as the global membership of CMT charter holders to ask what knowledge, skills, and abilities they want to see in their very next hire. Whether that's a portfolio analyst, a junior trader, somebody new to the research desk, we want to make sure that the CMT program is driving directly at those skills that are most useful in the industry. The CMT Association's program director and a committee called the Curriculum and Test Development Committee map that feedback to a set of learning outcome statements and they build the curriculum as well as the series of exams to reflect those specific industry best practices. Let's take a look at what's included in the CMT program. What was very telling about the last job analysis was that the core concepts of technical analysis have not changed but there are areas of emphasis that are very important to the industry. Risk management in a portfolio context in the post-financial crisis is one of the most important things that hiring managers want to see. They want to know that their portfolio managers and their traders have a very strong sell discipline and understand the concept of risk management. We've also found that there's much more quantitative and systems development work that needed to be included in the CMT program not only evaluating trading strategies and understanding performance, but also how to forward test, back test, run Monte Carlo simulations. And for CMT charter holders, understanding that quantitative systems design is very important for every job in the industry. Just recently, there was a Wall Street Journal article that talked about straders, so strategist traders, and there is a gentleman named Adam Korn at Goldman Sachs who, quote, every trader needs to know how to code. It's no longer enough to correctly read the markets or the signals that are coming from technical indicators. Our CMT charter holders must be able to synthesize that into a portfolio management context. And that is what is found in the CMT program. 
Of course, we've talked about portfolio management and we've talked about a number of the behavioral heuristics that need to be understood to properly manage money. Applying those concepts from behavioral economics is incredibly important in any client advisory role and understanding the emotions of investors is important for anyone in any institutional capacity. Now the candidate body of knowledge is packaged into the custom curriculum and organized into exam specific knowledge domains that provide a framework for recognizing and implementing investment and trading decisions. The CMT program no longer contains the same emphasis on classical techniques and pattern recognition, though the program does include discussion of some of those earlier works and those trading techniques in the level three, as we want every CMT charter holder to understand the evolution of the discipline, but technology has put an increased importance on the integration and application of those tools. Now there are no prerequisite courses required by the CMT Association to sit for the exams. However, to take the CMT exams, a candidate must have attained one of the following. You are either in the final year of an accredited undergraduate degree program, you've already graduated from an undergraduate program, or you have three years of professional work experience as an investment professional. Now, let's look at what it takes to get started in the CMT program. Everyone can join the association as an affiliate member in order to enroll in, this, in the program and sit for the exams. Upon successful completion of all three levels in order to use your CMT designation, candidates must apply for full membership through the admissions process where you will attest to meeting the professional requirements and be recommended by three sponsors from the association. Many more details can be found on the association's website and I encourage you to check them out. Now, as I mentioned, the program requires three levels of study that each lead to a computer-based examination. The levels progressively build on one another while increasing the emphasis on higher order reasoning. Let's talk about what's included on each level of the exam. Level one is an introduction to technical analysis. I mentioned there's no prerequisite courses. This is about basic definitions. This is your prerequisite course. We want you to understand the foundational concepts and for industry professionals, this exam will be very attainable. So you can see a list of topics which are called knowledge domains. The percentages represent the weightings of each topic on the exam. Level one is gonna cover markets, chart development and analysis, technical investment strategies, system testing, and statistical analysis. It's worth mentioning that ethics are tested on every single level of the exam. Now, you can look at the weightings for each subject matter, each knowledge domain, and understand that chart development and analysis is a huge portion of the exam. That's gonna help guide your studies as you prepare for the level one. Let's look at the exam format and how it is structured. In the level one, you have two hours to complete the exam. There are 132 multiple choice questions now it's worth noting as well that 120 of them are scored and 12 of these questions are what's used for psychometric evaluation. So 12 are unscored, you don't know which 12 they are, but those are gonna be used by the association later to make sure that the live exams always represent the best testable questions. Now, let's do some quick math here. 132 questions, two hours, you have less than one minute per question. We're gonna talk about some study tips and how to prepare for this exam in a minute, but what you need to know is that the level one is testing basic definitions, basic understanding of te technical concepts. So you either know it or you don't. And preparing for that exam is key and understanding how to move quickly through those test questions. There are 620 pages of reading to prepare for the level one, and you've got 60 to 100 hours as the recommended preparation time from the association. That's a really wide range. So based on your experience in the industry, how familiar you are with technical concepts, you might be at the shorter or longer end of this. But I think it's worth mentioning right here, right now, that even industry veterans need to spend some significant time preparing for these exams because they're specifically testing the material in the curriculum. It's not all about the casual way you may have learned these tools on the job and the specific definitions that are tested on the CMT program are only going to be found in that custom curriculum. Excellent, now level two is about theory and analysis. And it's all about the application 
of the technical analysis concepts you learned in level one. So at level two, it's not just about knowing the inputs or the formula of many of the indicators or how to construct the price chart, but also how to apply those tools, how to interpret the information that's coming at you from that price data. In certain market environments, combinations of different indicators can lead investors to successful positions. You need to understand how to apply these tools in combination. Let's take a look at the topic weightings as well. These knowledge domains are very similar to level one, but you see the weightings have changed. And there's the addition of a topic on risk management, which we talked a lot about just a minute ago. Ethics are still tested at level two, and we need to know that this is the integration of those technical tools. Let's look at the exam format. On level two, you have four hours to complete the exam, but it's a longer exam. You have 170 multiple choice questions. And again, these are testing higher order reasoning skills. So they're talking about applying the tools. 20 of those 170 questions are not scored. That's what the association uses for psychometric evaluation for live tests in the future. You don't know which 20 are unscored, so you need to take the entire test very seriously. Now, there are 739 pages of text in the custom curriculum to help you prepare for level two. And it's recommended by the association that you invest 70 to 100 hours preparing for the exam. Again, that's based on your level of experience and familiarity with these concepts. You're almost there. This is the level three exam, and it's about the integration of technical analysis into the portfolio context. This is by far the most rigorous of all three levels, both in terms of the topic coverage and the format of the assessment, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Now, there are separate knowledge domains covered on level three. The, presented, the percentages represent the topic weightings. Here, we're gonna still test on risk management, but we're also looking at intermarket analysis. That's the relationship between asset classes. We're gonna talk about portfolio management as well as the classical methods that I referenced earlier. I want you to understand the evolution of the discipline before you go out to practice it. Those behavioral finance components are crucial on level three, as well as volatility analysis, which is another component of how to manage risk. Finally, I need to mention that the ethics section is critical on level three. You cannot pass the level three exam unless you pass the ethics portion of that exam. I'll say it one more time. You have to pass the ethics section in order to become a CMT charter holder. So let's look at that exam format. You have four hours to take the level three exam. And it's important to note that this exam is brand new every single time that it's offered. So in every test window, both spring and fall, there's a single day for all level three candidates to sit. It's a brand new exam because it is vignette based. So it's not just your multiple choice questions, but rather a series of short answers based on a set of information. What this is doing is asking the candidate to take the role of the analyst, the portfolio manager, and the trader to decide whether you are buying or selling based on the information that you're presented. It's actually quite a fun exam. So let's look, 240 points over four hours gives you a, a rough idea of how long you should spend on each vignette. A 20 point set of questions should take you about 20 minutes. Now that's a mix of multiple choice and short answer, meaning the first question might be multiple choice, are you buying or selling at this level? You answer that and then the very next question is explain why. All of these exams are given in English and they are all computer-based tests. So you're typing in your answers on a computer at a Prometric test center. There are 910 pages of text to read to prepare for the level three exam. And it's recommended by the association that people invest 100 to 120 hours in preparation. As I mentioned, it's the most rigorous of all three levels. Moving right along, I need to talk a real quick word about ethics. A few years ago, the CMT Association adopted the CFA Institute's Standard of Conduct and Code of Ethics. Now, financial ethics are financial ethics, and the CMT's code was almost exactly the same as the CFA Institute's code. What we didn't have was a standards of practice handbook. That's all of the explanatory material, the case studies that candidates can use to understand the nuances of the ethics code. So it's the two-page code that's tested on all three levels of the exam, but you have the handbook or standards of practice that you can use to study those. 
You must pass the ethics portion on level three to become a CMT charter holder. And what's really interesting about this adoption is that now it's universal among CFA, CMT, and CAIA charter holders worldwide. So for those of you who are CFA or CAIA charter holders, there's 5% of the level three exam that you are already prepared for. And you're already abiding by this code and standards in your professional practice. In addition, one other quick note for CFA charter holders. In 2018, the CFA Institute launched a stackable credentials initiative of which the CMT Association and many other uh, credentialing bodies took part. So if you are a CFA charter holder, not a CFA candidate, but a charter holder, you can advance to the level two exam as soon as you begin your studies. You have a waiver on the level one. Now that waiver is on the level one exam. You are still responsible for all of the material, but we can help you get ready for your level two exam here at Wiley Efficient Learning. Now the CMT program is a rigorous professional course of study leading to an industry respected charter known around the world. The pass rates reflect that difficulty, but it is not unattainable. So looking at each level over the trailing six year average, the pass rates have been steadily decreasing. Here's our level one that went from 68%. Most recent exam in 2018, the pass rate was 61%. For level two, the average has been 65% and we dropped down to 59% here in 2018. And interestingly, at level three, the trailing rate has been 63%, but last spring, the candidates passed at a rate of 76%. And I'm gonna attribute that to two things. One, candidates who have reached level three are very committed to earning their CMT designation, which means they're taking their preparation and their study very seriously. I would also say that the materials and the efficient ways to study for this exam and prepare for success have improved dramatically over the last three years. So if you're just getting started in your CMT program, you have a lot to look forward to in terms of an efficient course of study and sound preparation materials to ensure that you're successful on exam day. Now by this point, you've probably recognized that the CMT program is rigorous. This is gonna take some work and you have to be ready to meet that challenge. That's why nearly every CMT candidate around the world now relies on Wiley Efficient Learning for the official curriculum and the review materials to help break down those readings into digestible chunks. Wiley Review Materials are specifically designed to help you master each and every one of the learning objectives throughout all three levels and ensure that you are prepared for success on exam day. Now the preparation for each candidate will vary based on their experience but the path is exactly the same. Prepare, study, and assess. Every candidate needs to map out their study plan, and we can help. The most common reason we hear for candidates who are not successful is that they simply ran out of time to study. Kids, careers, got lost backpacking in Borneo, whatever that X factor is for you, we understand it's hard to stick with your self-study. With the Wiley Exam Planner, you have a personalized study schedule based on the number of weeks until your exam day. The earlier you start, the more manageable your weekly investment will be. The diagnostic tools are gonna to help you focus your study to the areas where you need the most review, and the digital annotation tools in the CMT eBooks will give you a quick access reference point as you work through your final review leading into the exam. Now for the deep dive. As you work through hundreds of pages in each level of the official CMT curriculum, you wanna be efficient, thorough, and focused on comprehension. Wiley has now over 30 hours of video lectures taught by expert industry practitioners. Start with the course syllabus and those learning objectives at the beginning of each chapter, and from that overview, you'll progress through bite-sized 15 to 20 minute lessons that bring these concepts to life, while ensuring that you can fit focused study into your busy life. Use the lecture handouts to guide your participation in the online lectures. Now, for veteran professionals that are watching, we know it's easy to feel confident or gloss over subject areas that are familiar. But when did it hurt any of us to review the basics? And more importantly, the exam questions are precise. They can differ from those definitions that you may have picked up on the job. Remember, every level of the CMT program is a separate registration fee to the association. You only want to sit for these exams once. And finally, 
the CMT exams are timed, computer-based tests. Don't let the stress of exam day or the formality of the testing environment throw you off. Practice your test-taking skills while reinforcing your comprehension of CMT learning objectives. The sample questions were written to match actual CMT exam questions as closely as possible. Use the Wiley Efficient Learning Performance Metrics to get feedback on your personal areas of strength and weakness. Then, go back to review your annotations, rewatch a bite-sized lesson, and continue to drill on questions related to that knowledge domain. EfficientLearning.com forward slash CMT is the only place to find the tools and resources to help you master the body of knowledge and prepare for success on every level of the CMT exams. And if for any reason, if you're not successful in your first attempt, Wiley is committed to your success. With a partner until you pass promise, there is no resubscription fee to access your review course at any time. So I encourage you all to visit WileyEfficientLearning.com forward slash CMT and check out some of the free resources and study tips that are available for you. Now let's switch gears to the last and perhaps most important part of this presentation. How is, it, how is this going to affect my career? Well, the CMT Association has asked our members all around the globe what having the CMT did for them. And the feedback has been fantastic. First and foremost, this is the preeminent designation in technical analysis, which means that there's instant recognition and credibility assigned to CMT charter holders. It provides differentiated value. And in a crowded job market where everyone looks the same and you're competing for that position, having a set of skills and a toolkit that is different from what your colleagues are offering is going to set you apart and help you attain that position. Now, it's a complementary tool set to other disciplines. So some of the feedback has been how it has enhanced their professional practice. If you're a fundamental investor and you add in this layer, this cell discipline to your investment process, imagine how powerful that can be. Now, a couple quick stats. There were 59% of members who were recruited by headhunters solicited out of the blue for new positions after achieving their CMT designation. 38% were promoted from within their firms. 47 moved to completely new positions. Maybe they went from the trading desk into the research or asset management division. And 55% were given increased responsibility or greater AUM to manage after they had shown their mastery of the CMT skills, that technical analysis toolkit. Now, CMT charter holders are all across the industry in job roles as diverse as research, sales and trading, asset management, client advisory. And here's a quick look at those diverse career paths. You can see that many members are technical analysts, but also fundamental analysts, and they use their technical approach to help improve their practice. You have a lot of strategists, portfolio managers, people who work in the brokerage business and help with institutional sales and trading. There are roles for everyone who has a firm understanding of market price dynamics. Now let's look at some top employers of CMT charter holders. You'll recognize a lot of familiar names. These are just the top 15, but it's multinational banks, investment companies, fund companies. And what's interesting about our charter holders is that they're growing at a much more rapid pace in places like China and India than they are in the United States. We're starting to see these employers change. That list is representing more Kotak, Motilo Oswal, other securities companies from around the world. Now there's other value that comes from being a member of a nonprofit association like the CMT Association. That takes the form of corporate and regulatory advocacy. So I mentioned earlier that CAIA, CFA, and CMT charter holders are all bound by the same code of standards and ethical practice. That means a lot to federal regulators as the organizations approach those bodies for recognition and exemptions in different securities licensing exams. Here's some work that the CMT Association did on behalf of its members over the years. So in 2004, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act came out here in the United States and the then Board of Directors of the Market Technicians Association went before the SEC attorneys and argued for the validity of their discipline. They said, if you are going to exempt CFA charter holders on the new Series 86 exam, you need to exempt CMT charter holders as well. And after a year of presenting to those lawyers and the NASD, it was decided that there are two types of analysts on Wall Street. One is a fundamental analyst. They look at companies and they carry a CFA. 
The second is a technical analyst, and they evaluate price. They carry the CMT. More recently, the CMT program has been recognized by the Nebraska Department of Banking and Finance. Now, that's important for all private wealth managers, financial advisors, and registered investment advisors because Nebraska is looked to as the pinnacle for regulatory and securities licensing in the private wealth management space. CMT is recognized as a valid practice for all financial advisors, and we have seen a significant rise in CMT charter holders in those job roles since. Now, it doesn't just happen in the United States. There are ongoing initiatives with regulators across the globe. In Canada, each level of the CMT program qualifies for all 30 hours of continuing education credit required by the Government of Canada. IROC has recognized the CMT program. And in addition to all this regulatory advocacy, there is constant interaction with the firms, the investment banks, and the fund companies to advocate on behalf of CMT charter holders to help create that ecosystem of career paths and selection for all of those job roles. So thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you for being with us here today. And I encourage you to check out wileyefficientlearning.com forward slash CMT for more information about the CMT program and to help you prepare for exam day. See you soon.